Here's my setup. It's a Bentley Nevada rotor kit. Here's the rotor kit itself along with the proximeters that read the proximity probes on the rotor kit. And here's the speed control. Here's the IOTech box loaned from the Praxair Machinery Laboratory. And as far as what I'm using to read the data, that would be uh, this virtual instrument here reading the IOTech. Uh, this uh, particular software is called Easy Thomas, and uh, it's a virtual instrument type software. So this can be a spectrum analyzer, it can be an oscilloscope, it can be all kinds of things. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is reading data off of an oscilloscope. And instead of talking specifically about the Easy Thomas, I'm going to talk in general about oscilloscopes. So what you'll generally see is a time waveform that's sinusoidal like this and then a key phaser. So uh, in order to more clearly demonstrate it, I've drawn a diagram. Here's the key phaser trace. So uh, when you look at the key phaser, it will uh, be, uh, I should say when you look at what the key phaser is reading, typically it will be a smooth surface like this with a sudden drop off like this. The name key phaser comes from uh, if you uh, take a proximity probe, which is all a key phaser is, just a prox probe, and you put it over something that's mostly smooth but then there's a keyway perhaps or uh, some some other kind of mark uh, that lets the proximity probe see a different signal as the mark goes by. So that's the idea behind a key phaser. And the result is a waveform that looks like this. Smooth surface, smooth surface, key. Then back up and smooth surface, smooth surface, another key. Now typically they're not this nice, nice rectangles. For example, my key phaser uh, has an interesting waveform because of other imperfections in the surface that, that's supposed to be smooth. But as a general model, we'll talk about this. Okay, so here's the phase signal, the key signal, and then there's the proximity probe signal that's reading the vibration of the shaft. So just like you got a key phaser over here, you've also got probes that read the shaft. In this, this case we, we got XY probes that we're not looking at. We've only got a single radio probe right here that's reading the vibration at this point in the shaft. So when I look at the oscilloscope uh, what I say is okay here's my what I'll call the Y axis and then an X axis. So the Y axis I know that each division here is going to represent so many volts. They call it volts per division. And then I know, for example, that my proximity probes are 200 millivolts per mil. So by doing the math of how many spaces we are from peak to peak, because that's what we're, we're reading, displacement peak to peak, if I know how many divisions there are, I can convert that to how many volts and therefore how many mils. And then, in a likewise fashion, uh, what I can do with the y-axis, which is time, so we got amplitude over time, what I can do is uh, take a complete cycle of the shaft from uh, this positive peak to this positive peak. I know that that's going to represent 360 degrees of rotation. So then, uh, that tells me uh, how many divisions are in 360 degrees of rotation. So using that information now I can take a reading here that I call beta from the uh, negative going pulse of the tack to the the next positive peak. That'll be my beta reading. So that'll be a reading of time. However I can convert that into I can, can actually take this and divide it by uh, that my T, my period, and that, that will tell me how many degrees of rotation my beta is. So 
when we actually do the balancing exercise, I'm going to look use a sheet that looks like this. That's I'm going to record my amplitude, my peak to peak amplitude, as well as my phase. The first thing I'm going to do is get my original unbalance of the rotor. And I'm going to fill in on the sheet the phase and amplitude of that unbalance. So I'm going to go over to my rotor kit, switch it on, let it ramp up, and as it ramps up, you can see my virtual instrument here in oscilloscope or time dom domain mode. You can see as it goes faster and faster, the peaks uh, come together and I need to make sure that the machine's up to full uh, steady state speed before I take my first reading. And I can see that the spacing between the sine waves, uh, the, the, between the peaks isn't changing anymore, so I know it's up to full speed. So what I'm gonna do is hit pause here. And now I'm gonna read the values off of my instrument to find the phase and amplitude. Our first reading is a phase of 289 degrees and an amplitude of 1.8 mils. And the next step is to get the O plus T reading. To do that I'm going to apply the trial weight. Now there is a formula to select a proper trial weight however from experience with this rotor kit I know that this is a good trial weight to use and as far as where I put it, I sure don't want to put it on the high spot because it will drive the vibration through the roof because that's uh, approximately uh, around about where the heavy spot is. So if I put more mass there, it's going to make the vibration higher. So what I want to do is put it 180 degrees from the high spot. I don't know exactly where the heavy spot is, so I'm going to put it 180 degrees from the high spot, which would be 112.5 degrees, or excuse me, 109 degrees. However, the close to, closest slot that I have available is 112 and a half degrees, which is right here. So between 90 and 135. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my trial weight there and do another run. Now that my trial weight is installed, I'm gonna go ahead and start my rotor kit up again. I'm going to get data for the O plus T run. Go ahead and let it ramp up. The result I got for my O plus T was phase of 227 degrees and amplitude of 1.0 mils. What I'm going to do now is set up my polar plot paper. So first thing I want to do is mark rotation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to face my markings on the rotor and make sure that I'm looking from this end because this is how we're going to look at it and now I'm going to spin it and notice that it went in a counterclockwise direction so now for the rotor I'm going to mark the counterclockwise direction with an R and it's going counterclockwise. And now phase is always going to be measured against rotation. So they'll be going clockwise. We can verify that on our rotor kit right here. So as it's rotating counterclockwise, we'll, the key phaser will hit zero, then 45, then 90, and so on. So we know that we've got our polar paper set up right. The next thing we have to do now that we uh, established that phase is going to be right this way clockwise is what we're going to observe that there's two markings for each uh, degree marker so uh, that's to allow for either direction of rotation of the rotor but since we're reading phase going this way 0, 10, 20 we're going to cross off the top numbers because those don't apply for our direction of rotation. You can do that all around the paper. Now that we've established the proper measurement for phase, now we have to establish the proper measurement of scale for amplitude. What I'm going to use is uh, see these 
major circles here. I'm going to say each one represents uh, one quarter of a mil. For, so for our amplitude of 1.8, what we're going to do is go 0.25, 0.5, 0.75, 1 mil, and so on going by quarters of a mil to draw our vector. So I've drawn my O vector at 289 degrees and 1.8 mils. So there's a 290 mark, so a little bit before that, 289 degrees, and going by my scale, this is a length of 1.8 mils. Now I've gone ahead and drawn my O plus T vector at 227 degrees at 1.0 mils. So here's 220, 230, so 227 is right about here, and one quarter, one half, 0.75, and there's 1.0 mils. So what I've done now is some graphical uh, vector addition. I have had the O and the O plus T. Now I uh, made the T vector by going from the head of the O to the head of the O plus T. Give me the T, that's the effect of the trial weight. And I've transposed that to the origin just to give a representation of the effect of the trial weight. But the real takeaway for us is that there's a 33 degree angle here. So that means I have to take the trial weight and swing it this way by 33 degrees. However, I'm limited to 22 and a half degree in increments, so we're going to swing it this way 22 and a half degrees, and that should improve our vibration. So I'm taking the trial weight out and I'm going to use the same weight for the correction weight and swing it 22 and a half degrees. Put it in here for my correction weight. Now oh, here it goes. What should be the final run. You can see that the vibration's getting better and better as the peak to peak gets smaller and smaller. And we can see clearly that we're within the the one mil band, which is what our O plus T was, one mil. We started with 1.8, we improved to one mil, and now we're substantially within the one mil band well I'll call that maybe about three quarters of a mil that we're at now after doing a vibration correction